Good evening. Good evening. Good to see everybody here this evening. A little bit late, but that's okay. <laughs> Delayed reaction, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, I said in the verse this morning, it had a part about I, I myself will awake early. So that kind of fit this morning. Hebrews 2, 11 through 13. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Stand with me as we sing the first one in the hymnal, My Savior's Love. today and give you praise and glory and thanks for all the blessings you've bestowed upon us and be with our missionaries as they continue their jobs and try to win souls for Christ and be with all those that are sick and afflicted and may they get to be better if it thy will be done. This we pray through Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, Today's an important day, and this is an important week for us. We're getting ready to get our Christmas child stuff out and ready to be gone. So I hope you got yours in. We probably have it all in. We'll find that out a little bit later. How are we doing, Miss Susie? Good. Doing it up there. So that will move out. I'm going to tell you one more time in case you, if you know anybody that's able to body, that means can you can lift at least 50 or 60 pounds. And so... They're looking for people to help package and move this stuff all over in all the shipping areas, all the receiving areas, um, any place that they take it in uh, from now to Christmas time. I've got a couple of texts and a couple of emails toward that. Uh, you apply in person and it's at least 40 hours a week and they're paying 20 bucks an hour. So do you to move boxes around. So 
50 pound box is a pretty heavy box for you guys that don't know that, okay? <clears throat> so, uh, but uh, able bodied people, there you go, that's what we need. And it is, it's going to be, of course, you get holidays off. The only one they're going to do is Thanksgiving. So there you go. Amen. We do want to remind you that we have regular services every week during the week, and then we've got some special things happening, of course. Uh, next, this, no, they're not this week. Uh, coming up on the 8th, and it is a holiday, sort of, right? And it is sort of a holiday, the 8th. Uh -huh. It's voting day. It's voting day. Trey thought I was going to tell you it was his birthday, but it it is his birthday. And the ladies, are, are they coming for that or are they going voting? Okay, all right, there we go. You can, they're, they're going to go. How many, I ain't going to ask you that. I don't wait till the regular voting time because you have to go to your place to vote. Early voting, you get to go any place you want to. I like that. I vote my the ones closest to me was good, and they did a good job. They got us in and out real quick. There was a line when I got there. Moved us real fast, you know. Ah, get on, move your hand. Fill out those forms, you know what I mean? Go on, they got it. But it, I, I'm not kidding. They did a great job getting us through, and they moved a lot of people out there real quick. So if you see a line, don't let that bother you. They're, they're, they do a good job in getting it in. At least they did in the place that I went. Our missionary of the month is Stephen Zimmerman, Home Missions Project. And casas er, uh, abodes, adobes, okay, that means a, a mud house, a mud brick house, casas adobes in Arizona. Isn't that good? An adobe house. Think about it, okay, that's what it means, where it is. It must have been in the middle of nowhere at one time and somebody built an adobe house there. You know about that adobe house and that becomes a city. It's a pretty good sized town right now there. And he's had a church and started, been working on it for a long time. He actually went through a lot of health problems. God's brought him through those things, uh, we think. And then, uh, uh, of course, w when we met him early, and he didn't look like his picture up here. That His grandpa looked like that when I first met him. So, all right. <clears throat> and he looks, to me, he looks a little bit like the, his, his mom's dad. Okay, so he, he, he probably would disagree with that. But I'm telling you that. That's what your money does. That's what your missions does. And out of that, David, of course, his dad and his brothers and, and him are all been our missionaries, starting churches, being missionaries in foreign fields and other places. God bless those missionary families. So, and then you have a part in all that. Our anniversary Sunday is on the 20th, and we're going to go back this year to doing a, a like a traditional dinner on the grounds. And if you haven't heard about that, one of two reasons. Number one, we forgot to tell you. Or number two, you're not a very good cook. And so uh, <clears throat> we're preferring to say we forgot to tell you, okay? But, but uh, you can sign up in the back for that, for what's coming. We're going to have a morning Sunday school hour. We have a regular Sunday morning service, and we'll have the Wills family here singing a little bit during the Sunday morning service. And then uh, we'll, we'll have the sermon for us, and then when, then the Wills are going to sing. A, uh, we're going to eat lunch, and then the Wills are going to sing a little bit, and then we're going to play practice and all the normal things right soon as that is the concert part of it's over. No evening service that night. And uh, just ask God to take care of us through this, through this time. Remember the people we have, especially in holidays every year. I say, remember the missionaries. And if you don't pray for them any other time, pray for them at holidays. Will you do that? Uh, sometimes they'd ask, we used to have missionaries who would ask us to send them. They, they were in countries where you couldn't. Now you can get it from Amazon shipped to Europe, I suppose. They couldn't. You know, they wanted things like, you know, pumpkin in a can, uh, anything sweet because they couldn't get them in other places. And that's probably because they didn't eat them, but that's where we did for them. And in the, uh, and seriously, in the old days, Brother Edmondson and I both, we used to do the strangest thing for Christmas for a lot of the missionaries. We sent them cases of toilet paper because in some of the countries they were, they could not get it. Okay, remember when the rationing of the thing during, okay, remember how everybody got scared about all that stuff? Well, it was a it was a treasure. Sometimes they asked for other stuff. One of our missionaries asked for bologna on the field to send them a stick of bologna. Mrs. Edmondson carried as far as the <clears throat> checking into the country and then was arrested because you couldn't bring meat in the country. But it was okay. We got her out and she's fine. And of course, uh, but <clears throat> that there it's a little different on the foreign field what you can and what you can't get. And I don't know if you if you have traveled around the world, but I can tell you this. If you go any place besides the United States and you expect beef to taste like it does here, 
you're in trouble because it don't. It doesn't taste the same. And so um, to me, it, I never did find any place that tasted like it did here. But so you pray for your missionaries, and especially in the time in the holidays when they're in and out. They're a lot more fortunate than the old days. They can fly back and forth now. It's a lot easier. It's cheaper now to fly actually than even than it used to be. Um, even phone calls. You, you you call a missionary on the field 25 years ago, cost you $30 just for a minute or two to talk. See, we, we, we've we forgotten some of the things have moved up, but a lot of stuff's moved way down. I remember when we had a line phone call, if you... You, you know, people tried to cheat the phone company all the time because it was like a buck a minute for a long distance call. If you went to a pay phone, how many of you remember this when you'd say, that's going to be 25 more cents for the next 15 seconds. You I don't have it. You're done. So pray for your missionaries. A lot of their stuff has not changed from the way it was a while back, but they really do appreciate it. We get the neatest little notes. I get them that they, for the cards that you guys sign, put your name on, birthday cards, get well cards. Uh, I, you'd be amazed. I try to always get them to Susie, let her at least see them. And they come through writing back. So thank you for the cards. Thank you for this. Thank you for the card. Thank you for thinking about us. Thank you. Uh, it's a good thing. Then we have other people in the hospital. I know you're praying for those and for those things too as well. Right now we're going to pray together. Ask God to bless them. And I'm, I've been praying for the, for the Christmas boxes. On just on my own. Now, we have pictures of our missionaries we support passing out those Christmas boxes. So it's not like it's going to some weird thing, drink, but all of them help spread the gospel. They all come with, with a gospel message. They all come with a little short, not a short, it's like, what was it, an eight week, eight week or six week program that they can go back and, and go through a little bit of the gospel that's going out with that. Very good thing that Franklin Graham and his group put together. It skips kind of much all the shipping things and, and he pretty much it's a little more expensive than it would be if you had like some, you know, if Amazon was doing it, we could probably do it for 20 bucks, but they'd have so many rules we wouldn't be able, do you understand that? So, but he, it's going, it's going air. They're shipping everything air. So it's not going to be in a container six weeks or 10 weeks. They're going to get it there before, way before Christmas. And so we'd love to have you part of it. It's not too late to help. You say, well, if it is too late, we'll save it for next year when we do it again. And then I'm going to give you one more plea for you. Can I do it? We have home missions, home missionaries, and you can be a part of that. One of those ways is what we, we have up in, in the Homeless No More Project stuff. We're trying to get people off the street and make it possible. So I, I understand that there are people I don't, how many of y'all remember a guy like Billy Sunday? You, anybody remember who that was? Famous preacher of the past. Most of you, if you're here under 30, you never heard of anybody that didn't grow up at least till the 70s, okay? But he got saved because he was a baseball player. His life went bad. was an alcoholic wandering around the streets, and he wandered into a uh, one of those places that was preaching the gospel in one of the bad parts of town heard the gospel, got saved, became probably one of the best known evangelists in United States history. Okay. Most of us, I got saved the first time I heard the gospel. Most people don't. The great privilege of the homeless no more is they have their own churches. Okay. They get to reach and talk to those people over and over and over and over and teach them and train them and encourage them and help them to grow not just putting food on their back, not getting, there's a great thing in that. But it's a better thing to give them the ability to understand what the gospel is and to know what God can do with them and for them when they, when they know that. Right now, they need coats and stuff, guys. If you've got an old coat, you've got something, uh, blankets, things that they can use for the winter, that's a good thing to do. You wait and see. They'll be crying out pretty soon and, and all the rest of them for, for us to help, well, here's a good way to get ahead of the shot just a little bit. Pick it up. Look on the list. Or that's in, The list is posted somewhere. I forgot where it's at, but you can see it. Okay, it's up here. On, it comes on this, but I'm, we normally have it out someplace else. Just go through your closet. Look at that coat you had more in the last nine years. And uh, maybe it might be time to share that with somebody else.
But let's pray together. Father, we ask you to bless the missions. We do. We ask you to bless our church. We ask you to bless our people. And Lord, without saying more than needed, we ask you, Lord, to be in our lives and everything that we do. We love you, Lord, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me and sing number 34, Living by Faith.
will be going home when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children. The dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the air. And then those that remain will be quickly changed. And at that midnight cry, when Jesus comes again, I look around me, I see prophecies fulfilling, and the signs of the time, they're appearing everywhere. I can almost hear the Father. As he says, son, go get my children. And at the midnight cry, the bride of Christ will rise. When Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children, the dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the air. And those that remain will be quickly changed. And at that midnight cry, when Jesus comes again, and then those that remain will be quickly changed. And at the midnight, midnight cry, when Jesus comes again, when Jesus comes again. Ladies and gentlemen, get your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 29. And uh, we're going to start a series tonight. It's really not about the brain. We're going to talk about that brain thing you have tonight. Uh, if you've ever heard Dr. Dobson, uh, he, of course, he was trained as a psychiatrist originally and still dabbles in it a lot. He may be one of the better Christian psychologists, psychiatrists in, in our country now or, or ever. Not, not many of those people actually made it that far or got that famous. And he stayed so faithful over the years. You know, it's tough when they vote you out of your own ministry, right? Amen. And uh, so if you have your Bibles and you're turned over there, chapter number 29, we're going to start reading in verse 17. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit. I'm going to talk to you about conscience. The whole series is going to be about a conscience. But, you know, uh, not everything has a conscience. Not everything created has a conscience. My personal opinion is it's limited to a few and I'm in my own self, I would think probably that humans are the only ones who really have a conscience because you'd have to understand there's a God. Does everything obey God? Absolutely. It's all created by God and does what God tells it to do. When God gets ready, he's going to change the creation back and we won't have earthquakes and we won't have storms and we won't have any of that kind of stuff. But right now it obeys our God. When the, blue, when the wind was storming on the sea, Jesus could by his voice saying stop, and it stopped. Now, I believe that this conscious thing God gave us is because he made us. David said we're fearfully and wonderfully made. There are so many things about humans that we have that besides just a, an opposing thumb, other things have a few oppo things have an opposing thumb. And... Uh, we have a lot of abilities to go with that. God gave us tremendous ability to advance. And we have been given, if we could, if we could duplicate just the physical part of us, and for eons, people have been trying to duplicate that, or they make movies about somebody that could create a uh, a man-made um, android or something that would have the ability to move, think, and function like a human would. 
Uh, I don't know that they'll ever get that. I'm not sure you could ever get that kind of feeling out of a machine or anything that goes with it. But you could program it close. But you know, we're all given that. From the smallest child or anything else, I was back in the back while ago, and one of our ladies had had their baby with her. The, the baby is a few months old. And uh, the, she woke up. The baby woke up. She looked up, and her mom was there. And she just smiled. <laughs> Everything's okay. Isn't that cool to see that when that happens? All right. Now, in the book of First Chronicles, chapter 29, I'm just going to read a couple of verses here to, with you. Verse 17, it says, And I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart. Now, I want you to understand this. In your Bible, the heart, the mind, the conscience, and all that's all tied together. And when he's talking about your heart, he's not talking about your blood-pumping organ. He's, he's talking about, you know, if a man believe with all of his heart that you love the Lord with all of your heart. Okay, he's, you know, if, if you were of some of the ancient people, they believed the most important organ was the heart. It was the liver. So we'd be saying, trust the Lord with all your liver. Amen? All right? But I want you to understand, look what he said. For I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and had pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of mine heart, I have willingly offered all these things, and now have I seen with joy thy people, which are present here, to offer willingly unto thee. Most of you figured out who this is. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, that's the other name that Jacob had, God gave him, our fathers keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people. There's another way to express a mind without saying the word. But I want you to think about that one word he put in there. Imagination. Humans had the ability to imagine. Now that's different than dreaming. To imagine. And the thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their hearts unto thee. I give unto Solomon, my son, a perfect heart to keep thy commandments and thy testimonies and thy statutes and do all these things to build the place for which I have made provision. Now, actually, this sermon I wrote a couple of weeks ago before I preached this morning about the temple. They have no connection, but they're pretty much about the same thing. All right, David's asking for Solomon to be able to do what Solomon said he got done in this morning's sermon. In, in the mind, I, I want you to think with me. Uh, I've been doing a little bit of study, and it's not as hard as it used to. You used to have to go somewhere, and now we just get on Google, we find anything. You know what I mean? It's out there, all the books. Uh, if you look in my back, in the back on the back shelves back there, I have a whole set of big red books, commentaries. There are about like 30 or 40 different commentators in it. And I bought that when I first moved to Texas, and I became a pastor and just for looking for references. I'm not much of a commentary user. I have to tell you that. I, I do like to know other people's opinions about stuff. I paid almost $400 for that set of books. You can get the same thing today in digital form on one, one CD or probably on now, you can get it on a thumb drive for about 10 bucks and you can download it straight from it for $10. Plus, if you do the digital one, you can get hundreds of books included with it that did not come with that set. Isn't that cool? That's the age we live in. Do you understand, most of us know a little bit about computers. A little bit. Some of us are <clears throat> iPad people, and we it's picture-oriented, you know what I mean? Uh, then you got all of us diehard computer people. We're, we're using a mouse. I don't care what you say. My new computer says, you could accomplish the same thing by simply speaking to me. I don't want to talk to her. <laughs> I don't want to talk to her. I just want to flick my mouse, okay? And got it on there. I'm down into that. Does yours new one do that? Mine does. You're just kind of, okay, you can just speak to me. I could do that. It, no. And I'm typing with three fingers, no matter what she says. <laughs> Because that's the way I do. 
But in, in this thing, look, look with me. It's been said that the human brain is the most complex organ in our bodies. And listen to me, several times over these last centuries, scientists have said that it is probably the most complex object in the known universe. First of all, we're not exactly sure how this great big glob of fat does what it does. We figured out a few things about it. Do you know how you're supposed to get your cholesterol down? From everything I read, that your brain pretty much consists of that. All kinds of, okay, it's strange, it's serious. It's not anywhere near as big as an elephant's brain, but your brain's way more complex than that. It's an amazing thing God did with you. Now I want you to look at a couple of things. Think about the ability to control massive physical structure. Your, your brain can do that. You can learn to do stuff. I taught my, showed my grandkids, I learned to wrinkle my nose like a rabbit. Your brain can figure out how to do that. Seriously, now y'all are practicing. Go ahead, you're in church, you can do it. Okay, you can make your nose move. And I can make my ear move too. Y'all don't see me make my ear move? All right, see there. But you can control this whole system with your brain. We figured out that you can get your blood pressure down by taking your mind and putting it over your body. Breathing right, thinking right, calming down. Isn't it amazing what, what goes on with this structure we have? Look at this. The brain can compute abstract thought as easy as it does non-abstract thought. Now, I remember a couple of guys in a story I heard, and this didn't really happen. It was just a story, so don't call the Humane Society, okay? <laughs> but there's two older guys saying, you know, why do you have a cat? They never do anything you say, so my cat does exactly what I tell him. And he said, I'll bet you a hundred bucks your cat don't do the, what you tell him. He said, oh yeah. So he picked the cat up, threw it up in, on the front of the hearth by the fire and said, get out of there. And of course, <laughs> see there? All right. Do you understand that we understand humor, non-humor, inflection of voice? We have all kinds of stuff. Now, some of the animals are good at that. Your dogs learn when you're saying, what are you doing? Because you probably aren't happy, okay? All right. But you know what the dog, you know, when you're telling your dog, look, Rover, that's the sixth time this week that you've torn that up, and I've talked to you, Rover. Next time you do that, but I'm, and here's what he's hearing. Blah, 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 Rover, blah, 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 Rover, blah, 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 Rover, okay? And he's smiling. They love me, amen? Now, I want you to get this, okay? A lot, a lot of animals had emotion, and we love it when a man, they, we, we can even imagine that they're having emotion. We can look at a turtle and go, look, they're smiling. There's, there's a, I'm serious. How many pictures have you gotten of animals of some really cute thing like a lion smiling? You know, whatever else. One of my friends sent me a deal. He guess he had never heard the joke before about the guy tell, asking the Lord to make the lion that's coming after him a Christian. And, the, you know, the lion, God answers it, and the lion stops to pray, thank you, Lord, for the meal we're about to take, you know. <clears throat> I said, what, what do you think about that? A P-R-E-Y-ing lion. A praying lion. Now see, that's only funny because you can see outside the box. Your, your brain can grab a hold of that abstract thought. You have the ability to imagine. I, I want you to understand how wonderful this is. I'm going to read you a couple things in a minute. Emotions. Your emotions are handled as easy as breathing. Sometimes they're as out of control as breathing. They're almost involuntary. Why is it that we need somebody, that we need some, if you're some, a human, and you say, I don't need anybody to love me, you're weird. You have a mental problem. Because that's not the way God created you. 
He loves, and he had made a creature to be able to love. And he made us have the ability, listen, to know he's there and to love him back. You see how important it is for you to understand abstract stuff and to be able to, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. You can reason, it can understand, it can observe, it can learn, and it can imagine. Now I'm going to read you a couple of things. What is the memory capacity of a human brain? Got out of the Stanford study, says this, the human brain's memory capacity in an average adult can store trillions of bytes of information without problem. If you don't think so, I was thinking tonight when the before services, they sit and they start in one page and they play a verse and then they go to the next page and they go to the next page and go to the next. You know, it would be fun some not just to sing along with them. Just flip it over and sing to the next and sing the first verse and just flip through the book. Most of us, once they start playing it, we can sing the song without looking in the book. We, you can start. I forgot how many hundreds of thousands of songs that your brain can retain in it. It's an amazing thing. That's why God in the Old Testament taught His people to learn songs because you could repeat them easy. It's reported that the, the cerebral cortex alone has 125 trillion synapses. That's medical stuff. The ability to gain pieces. In the same study, it was reported that one synapsis can store 4.7 billion bits of information. Neurons are the cells which process and transmit messages within the brain, and the synapses are the bridges between the neurons which carry the transmitted messages. Running the numbers, 125 trillion synapses, 4.7 bit synapses, or about 1 trillion bytes equaling 1 terabyte Of in, in one single pathway of your vine, each sector, no problem. The storage capacity is an amount over 74 terabytes in the cerebral cortex alone. Now, I'm, I didn't make this up, guys. I'm reading it from the study. If you got a new computer, tablet, or smartphone, you understand the phrase megabyte, gigabyte. Okay, we've learned that. 25, 30 years ago, they might not have thought about it. This, the first time most of you all heard the thing about the K, how, many, how much memory you got? And we, we, don't, we, we, we didn't have a clue. Somebody finally told us, you know, that Y2K was coming, 2000, and the whole world was going to shut up and turn dark and we we're going to disappear in the vapor. Not me, I just reset my computer to a back, to a back time and it didn't know it was that time, all right? All right, put it this way. The, the knowledge might help you to grab this. Early generational pur purpose computers, at best, had a few megabytes of hard drive. Now, I was fortunate to be in a portion of places and around things that probably most of you didn't ever get to be around early. And I, 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 have, I got to see one of the mainframe computers that the government owned a long, long time ago. And it was huge. It was big as half the wall in this room. It was had it had all kinds of running things and lots and tapes and things moving on it and, and, and it was it literally was mechanical. And so when they say it got a bug in it, usually in some contact they had a bug crawled in there and it wouldn't work anymore. And that's where that phrase comes. It's got a bug in it. It really had a bug in there because it was hot. It, there were there were thousands of tons of air conditioning to cool this thing off. Now, I'm not, guys, it had a power cord about that big around running it. It could add and subtract and multiply and divide. Y'all are waiting for a punchline, aren't you? There isn't any. That's what it did. The computer that took Apollo 13 to the moon and back, how, how many of you know how much that computer had in it. Somebody tell me. I got it written up here. I know. Okay. How much did it have? Ugh. You kidding? No. It was amazing. Your telephone has about five to 10,000 times more storage 
than that computer did. 540K memory. You can't even run the smallest of program today on that. In the smartphones, we have gigabytes. If you don't have gigabytes, you're nothing. All right? To put this in perspective, a computer board, the first Apollo astra, uh, 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 spacecraft had about 200, uh, 540. The computer that is an example of 1,000 megabytes, which is over 64,000 characters of information, today, your toaster is smarter than that. Your cookers have 10 times that much. If you got one of those digital cookers and you set it to do things and it's got 10 times that much in it. Matter of fact, when we're talking about the number of, of a memory in most things of, of higher levels, like Google and stuff like that, we're talking about petabytes, P-E-T-A, petabytes. Over 1,024 terabytes. Now, you say, well, what does that mean to me? Well, let me explain to you what your brain can do, okay? According to the Scientific American, the brain has a memory capacity reported equivalent of 2.5 petabytes of memory. Put that in perspective, according to the computer world, the internet giant Yahoo has created a special 2.0 petabyte data warehouse. Yahoo uses the immense information to store the capacity and warehouse to analyze the behavior of half a billion monthly visitors. It's not only the world's largest single database at the time this was written, which was probably 10 years ago, okay? It's also the busiest. Now look at this. By comparison, the IRS owns a massive data warehouse which keeps track of 300 plus million Americans, millions more businesses, and only has the capacity of 150 terabytes. Now, remember what, we get with you, you ready? Yahoo's 2.0 Computer Center, which can process 24 billion events in a day, is 20% smaller than the capacity of a normal human's brain. God made you to do things. I know we're not doing it, and that's what sin causes. We will never reach our full potential because sin distorts who we are, what we are, and what we can do. And it always has, and it always will. Have you ever thought how where you would be in your life if it weren't for the sinful detours that shut you down and moved you over and put you aside? And You ever thought about churches? If churches didn't go through the traumas of all the sinful things that happen with the sinful people who work in sinful churches in the best of us, what we could do in reaching the world. I want you to understand your mind has the ability to do way more than you're using it for. Now that's just the physical capacity of it. It has the ability to imagine. All you have to do is imagine. How many of y'all remember when that pushing the status quo movie came, show came out every week, Star Trek. You know what I mean? They were flying all over the galaxy and the poor guys in red suits died all, every week. Only the guy in the red suit. And if you're a red suit guy, you're done. You know, that was just the way it went. You know, remember they walked to those doors and they would go, you know, like that. You know, whatever. Some kind of tweet thing. Some guy was making that voice with his voice, okay? That, there were guys on the outside. You ever seen the rough cuts of that or the things that went bad? There's people out there you couldn't see opening the doors and closing it. And every once in a while, they'd mix it up and shut on it on them and do stuff, but it's kind of funny. You know, you know what somebody did? In, in just a few months, somebody watching the thing says, I could build doors like that, and the next thing you know, you're going to the supermarket and stepping on the deal, and the door opened all by itself. Pretty soon, we figured out swinging in and out wasn't good, so we did sliding ones, and you didn't want to get the water wet. So we, now we picked up thing that picks up your presence it sees you there and does it for you now we don't even blink an eye at that 40 years 30 years 40 years ago everybody went and went whoa that's like new space stuff anything we can imagine 
Can you, who, who had it in their mind that they're going to go to the moon and why? I, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm not going to get sidetracked here, but I want you to understand all of you people that are against that kind of thought and that scientific, do uh, uh, you understand where your microwave come from? You know where a good portion of your medical ability and things come from? You know where vaccine, a lot of the vaccinations we have come from? You know where that wonderful thing that you like to put in your oven and stuff and microwave in for that ability, all that come, we had hundreds of thousands of, of new things generated from the space program. Our aircraft and everything else benefited from that. Even if we never go anywhere, instead of spending it on studying turtles, let's spend it on making humanity better. I'm not, I don't have anything against a turtle. I stopped on Green Oaks the other day and helped a turtle cross the road. Okay, so. <laughs> Wait, can I say I'm a turtle lover? <laughs> God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And here's the problem with our imagination. Ready? Because we have a sin nature. We have a tendency to imagine the wrong things. Not always in the scriptures that say that. Because we, had, Solomon just said in, in the verses that you had, that if we can just imagine what God could do for us. If you're a Christian, that's really, really important that you could imagine. See, here's the problem with most of Christianity. We can't imagine God even wanting to use us. See, we're imagining something else. And God has a place in his life for you. Imagine that. God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Almost every creator of all the new modern conventions somewhere in their life, the guy that created the CRT, the first television tube, when he saw what humans did with television, said, if I'd have known they were going to do that, I would have never brought it out in public. See, we could see thousands of great advancements for humanity. Instead, we got laughing. Okay. And most of the time, what, what, what did our parents call it? The boob tube. Because okay. you got dumber the more you watched it. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one. Now, this is this is Babel, watch. And they all have one language, and this they began to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. It, one of the great powers of a, of a great people, of a great church of of a great country or any place else is when we have a unified people who have a unified purpose and you get all these people and somebody says, you know what, I got an idea. Oh, you know what? And our imaginations kicked in and we can see ahead of time. Think how, how our founding fathers must have, that must have been to them. Think something brand new on the face of the earth that we could have a country, a people who were run by the, over the under the authority of a God of the God of heaven, who's we saw as our rights coming from God. Guys, I want you to know, we, as far as I know, there wasn't anybody else in the whole world ever known that. And that people would run the government. I think that's what Daniel saw when he was looking and God said, there's going to be something in the future that's going to be like a lever with four heads. Because to him, a democracy, would, if there was nobody singly in charge like a king, Everybody's in charge. It'd be like, a, where would a leopard with four heads go? Which one would tell them? You know, a democracy is hard to figure out, isn't it? A republic is the greatest thing, and that's what ours was supposed to be. But we have the ability because we can imagine that. Imagine that. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but to everyone that is hasty only to want. Now, here's, here's the problem. What, what do we do with this great ability? What do we do with it? If you ask most people right now, they know a whole lot about nothing. They can take all their combined knowledge of everything they know. If you turned off the electricity, they would die. I'm not against you having all, I told you I have a computer at home. I got one of and guys, listen to me. If it takes more than 30 or 40 seconds for my programs to come up, 
I'm, I'm updating my computer. I don't like that. You, have, you know when you have to go get, you can go get a cup of coffee and fix breakfast before the program comes up? You need to update your stuff, okay? Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on thee. Now there's a reason, guys. Not one of us has ever got into trouble without first milling it over. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's our imagination running. I can imagine this. And I'm, I'm telling you, if, you're, if you have a problem with pornography, you've got an imagination that's way out of control. But it stirs up things that are not literal, because that it really is imagination. That's not the way life really is. That person that somebody took a picture of is somebody's little girl, or at least used to be. That's not what I want my people to think about my little girl or my grandchildren or anybody else. I've always wondered what, how that, that affects people and that always does negatively. But that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. I mean, your responsibility is to keep that imagination of yours under control. And I, I'm headed toward conscience, can you tell? I'm not going to get there tonight, but I'm headed there. It shall come to pass when you shall be multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord. God said that the imagination of Israel, they have walked with the presence of the God. They've seen his miracles in their life. They know the redemption of the ark being the presence of God in their midst. But there's going to come a time they shall no more say the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember Neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. See, an imagination out of control takes you places you don't want to go. You have to keep your imagination under control. Is it wrong to have it? No way. No way. God gave you that ability. When I go back to Genesis, it said, nothing they imagined will be withheld from them. They're building Babel. We went to the moon. We're not talking about in our in our time. We're talking back in the 60s when John Kennedy was president. President, you understand that? You got the largest thing we got's a 540k. You could put it on well, I don't know how many of you could just put it on an old old CD. Thousands of them. It's an it's an amazing thing. We have that but it has not helped our ability to move us. That knowledge has not been combined with the ability to use what we know to make us better. It seems like as we gain knowledge, we lose wisdom. Part of that has to be retained by imagination and this thing called conscience, and we're going to get there. Your mind has the ability to think. You can think and reason. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. You know where that's found? Isaiah. Let's reason this thing together. You ever sit down with somebody and say, okay, now you believe everything your friends tell you. Have they ever lied to you? Yes. Have they ever stole from you? Yes. Have they ever cheated you? Yes. Have they ever got you in trouble? Yes. Why do you trust them? Come on. Where's the reasoning at? Well, see, the loss of the conscience, and we're going to get there later, where the wild imagination puts you in prison because this is the third time you've got caught for running drugs, and your whole time you're in there, you're saying, next time when I get out, I know what I'm going to do now. I'll, next time I'll win. And you won't. The reality of it is when sin is finished, what's it bring? Death. Among whom also, look, we had our conversation in times past, the lust of the flesh, fulfilling desires of the flesh and of the mind, were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That's not where Christian people are. My Bible says that we're supposed to have the mind of Christ. Now that, I want you to real quick, that doesn't mean that you have to, you have the same brain that Jesus did, okay? That's another use of the term mind. 
Sometimes mind means other stuff. Your children are supposed to mind you. Ha, huh, you weren't thinking of that one, were you? Mind your manners. See, that's staying within a boundary. Sometimes your mind is that storage capacity thing up there. Sometimes it's your thoughts and your imagination. So let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. To think. But when we have the mind of Christ, it means we learn to think like he would have us think. We do not get his brain. We know what he wants. And we do it. You ever, you ever had anybody say that? I've had a guy say, well, you know, if we have the mind of Christ, no matter what we do, we're doing the right thing. That would conflict with all the other stuff that the scripture says about how wicked we were, wouldn't it? We can't be. I had a guy tell me that, hey, and, and they think strange things. She said, one of my friends says, for all of sin. So that means God must be a sinner too. So I'm just as good as he is. So your friend don't know the rest of the verse. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, that pretty much puts him outside your circle and mine too. We have a mind. We have the ability. We have a great reasoning, but we also have a downfall. We have sin in our life. I don't care. You say, well, preacher, I'm saved now and I don't sin. My Bible said if any man said he doesn't sin, he's a liar and the truth's not in him. Guys, we deal with it as long as we're in the flesh. When we leave the flesh behind, it's going to be a whole different thing and we'll have a whole new body and all those things will be done. But not right now. I'm still dealing with that. You say, how will I know when that's not over? When you're not a male or female anymore and it ain't, it's not something you made up in your mind. You still are, okay? Um, it's, it's amazing to me. We're in the most precarious position in the whole world in our country. And we're going to call people if we need them. We're going to draft the people in our mind who get offended if you don't use the right pronoun talking to them. I don't believe Patrick Henry could have believed that. Think what I'm saying. This I'll say therefore and testify in the Lord. You hence not walk in the, as other Gentiles do in the vanity of your mind. You can fill your brain up with vain things. You can occupy every second of your life with vain things. You can do all kinds of stuff and take every ability that God gave you and waste it. And you start with it when you do it with your mind. We want you to think. The mind has the ability to remember. You remember. And you don't just remember like 30 minutes ago somebody fed you. If you're like all most of us, the more traumatic something was, the more it stays in your memory and the fresher it seems to be all the time. For some reason, I can remember little pieces of things that happened in my life. Way back there, they have nothing to do, just little pieces of stuff. Something somebody said, something that happened, something that went wrong. I don't remember why, but I have this really early, early, early memory of deciding that I was just going to get on my tricycle and run away from home. <laughs> then I, I don't know, I hope, I guess I come to myself, I probably couldn't ride to the end of the driveway, all right? But I can remember that. Probably from some watching some movie, guy walk, running off in the sunset, I don't know, but I can tell you this. You have, you have the ability to remember, and you have to remember the ability to remember your hurts better than anything else. That storage capacity you got, it's somehow corrupted by the sin that's within us. And you won't remember all the wonderful things people have done for you and to you, but you'll remember the one time somebody hurt your feelings. If it was a computer system, you would just erase that file. 
Whatever you put in there stays in there. You have a tremendous memory. Remember what I said? How many little pieces of memory you can stick in that brain? But see, you choose what you imagine and you choose what you remember. <coughs> Think what I'm telling you. Where am I headed toward? I'm going to head toward this great thing that God put over us and he uses in the word of God that we call that combination of memory, all the stuff he put together, that function, the anger, all, all that stuff that we make decisions with, that imagination, and we call it a conscience. And that has several meanings too. If I would say, if I'd use, if I'd put a little couple of words and letters in front of it, you'd understand. If I said, well, he's unconscious. I don't mean I'm dead. It's just not, means what? Now, I hope it's not normal. But anyhow, Paul, look at this. Peter said the second time the cock crowed, he remembers it. He remembers, hey, that rooster crowing reminds me what the Lord told me I was going to do. The second epistle I write unto you to stir up your binds. And he's not talking about bad things. He's talking about good things here. Paul said to these people, whose end is destruction, whose, mind, whose God is their belly, who glory in their shame, who mind earthly things. See, it's not their brain he's talking about now. It's the way of thinking. We have the mind of Christ, and we should be able to learn to think like he thinks. You have a great ability. I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you speak the same things, there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I have never wanted to read other people's minds. And I'm very grateful other people can't read my mind. <laughs> Amen? I really am. And I'm grateful for that. God gave you the ability to think. He gave you the ability to store, put into it. David goes back, and we, we forget it sometimes when he says, Thy word have I hid in my heart. Now, is he talking about having your heart tattooed? No, he's talking about you storing the word of God in your mind. In your mind. Years ago, I had a guy in the church and he got really upset with me because I was trying to get my adults to learn Bible verses. I want my teens to learn Bible verses. I want my young kids to learn Bible verses. He got angry. He said, I don't have the, remember that, the ability to remember all that kind of stuff. And I remember his name. I won't call it to you, but I said, I got a question for you. Let's, I know that upset you. Let's go. Let's think about it. How do you think the Cowboys are doing? And he started. He started rattling off. This guy's doing good. This guy's got this. Guy, he got this together. He has, and he's got this. And he's got. And this is happening. And these got. And, and I said, "Isn't that funny? You know everything about every player on the Cowboys roster, but you can't remember a Bible verse." And he made an accusation, and I said, it's true. He said, you're not going to be happy to we're all just like little Jesus is. I said, amen, brother. That's where I'm wanting, and that's where I'm headed myself if I can do it. But see, you can. It's what you want to do with your mind. What are you putting into it? See what time it is? All right. I'm going to say one thing, and I'm done. I am against you reading the filthy, nasty books. You're storing stuff in your mind that does not need to be there. I think it's wrong to use pornography because it's wrong, number one, to put those people who are back there. A lot of them are forced to do that. Other people are making money off of it and they're almost slaves to it and you're doing with it for it is nowhere near what a Christian ought to do with that lust that's in your heart and eyes and mind. You don't need to have that in your life. I'm against in your show and letting your kids and doing and doing the things that have to do with witchcraft and sorcery and all that kind of stuff. 
You see, I, somebody this week was talking about they had they got they were had to go. Their parents took them to see when they were little kids. Took them to see the uh, the exorcist because they wanted them to be exposed to it. Now I'm going to tell you something. Oliver B. Green died about 50 years ago, maybe 60 years ago. Most of you don't even know who that is. But he was one of the original radio preachers. When there wasn't 10 in the country, he was in North Carolina preaching the gospel over most of the stations he could get on. I talked to a guy no more than five years ago that somehow stumbled across a recording of Oliver B. Green preaching about Jesus. He heard the message and got saved in his car. I, had, Dr. Jerry Falwell was not a personal friend of mine. He was a friend of mine. He, was, he had such a great memory. It was unreal. He always was saying, if he met you, Every time he'd go, hey, George, how you doing? How's Cheryl? How are the two kids? Tommy must be about this old right now. And you go, gosh, what a... You, you never want to argue with a guy because you're always lost, okay, no matter what. <laughs> Super smart guy. And all he does. He's been gone a long time. If you could get saved from listening to one of his messages today, if you got a video of it and you could see that, these messages that we're recording and send out there, if they show up somewhere 20 years from now and somebody watches our videos, they can get saved, couldn't they? What makes you think that you couldn't become demon-possessed by watching that junk? The devil is a counterfeit. He's a corrupt counterfeiter. He has to do things almost as God does it. And God will not force you to trust him. But the more the doors opened up, the more you hear, the more the ability, the more likely you are to trust him as Savior. I don't think there would be anybody possessed with a demon. See, to let get Jesus in your life, you have to open the door. Now, I want you to understand, go read Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. And he's not just talking to a person. He's talking to a church. I'm on the outside. Let me in. He's talking to a church. If he, you open the door, he comes in. Personally or as a church. That same thing works with the devil too. I don't think there's anybody possessed with the devil who didn't first invite him in. And you invite them in by the things you listen to, by the things you read, by the things you watch, and by the things you think on. Let's pray. Father, I'm grateful to you that you gave us the ability and the Word of God contains an answer for all of this stuff. What tremendous creations we have made, been made. The mind that you gave us, the ability to reason that we have. And a lot of times, Lord, we waste it. Lord, help us to be more valuable servants than that. Our, our body, you said, belongs to you. We're not our own. Our mind, our heart, we're supposed to love you with. Not just some emotional thing, but Lord, the reality of it, a real relationship with a real God in an everyday real life. I can't see us doing that, Lord, unless we get our heart, mind, especially, Lord, our conscience in a place that what we believe to be right is what you say is right. And, Lord, deal with our hearts about all these other issues, we pray. And in Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me.
God and our Father, help us, Lord, to fill our cup each and every day, our heart and our mind, Lord, with the things of you, and Lord, to uh, seek to do the things that you would have us to do. Help us, Lord, as a church to maintain our stand. Lord, help us be in prayer and in service for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.